disgruntled about their new job, and maybe the impact, of the likelihood and the impact will be a little bit higher there. But we try to focus on things that actually matter. We use the CIA model for identifying what we think are high risk things. If you haven't taken uh, the classes yet to talk about that, it's a standard security model, confidentiality, integrity, availability. You can kind of think of access control being right in the middle of that triangle because it affects all of them. If you circumvent access control, you're going to affect the confidentiality, you're going to be able to modify data, there's the integrity, you'll be able to make data go away, there's the availability. So we use this as a rough guide to help us understand the things that are actually important to a railroad. And just get, get you guys thinking, what, what do you think out of those three? Confidentiality, availability, integrity. Which one's the most important to you guys? Integrity. Integrity? integrity? Who said that? Right there? Why do you think so? That's a huge company. They probably want integrity to be really important so that their old customers can continue relying on them and their new customers can trust the future of the company. Yep, definitely. What do you think? Availability. Availability? Why is that? Because of the trains don't know exactly when another train is coming and they go on the wrong track, well, you can have a very big accident and something good. Very true. I see one more hand. I was going to go with integrity for pretty much the same reason. If we are wrong about where that train is, we got just the same problem. Mm -hmm. True, true. Anyone for confidentiality? Let's see if we can get one more arguing out there. Which one, which one is the most important? The truth is that they're all unrelated, so you, you could argue yourself out of all of them. But, um, Honestly, we tend to focus on availability as the primary one because if trains aren't rolling, the company's not making money anymore. If the company's not making money, um, that, that's a big deal. So we tend to focus on availability, but confidentiality and integrity play so much a part into that. I mean, we have plenty of confidential information, whether it's employee files or uh, customer files, and you know, integrity of any of the data. If the back-end systems don't work, know where trains are, uh, that's a big deal. So ultimately, they all, they all play off each other. But as we look at systems, availability is definitely key for the railroad. So another important thing here is uh, we're, we're hiring. Uh, we hire full time. We're, we're hiring interns as well. We have a great summer intern program. Uh, Jake got to hang out with us last summer. Uh, I don't know if you want to say a few words about the exciting times at Union Pacific. Uh, yeah, so I'll say some exciting times. I'll say this is like if, if you want to have an internship where you get to dive in and play bad guy, this is that internship you do get to break into things and find like things that are wrong and then exploit them within your first few weeks and it's a lot of fun and you, it, it really is the real deal. It's, it's awesome, you're doing real work. Uh, you're also not alone, there's tons of interns, but it's also not like you're put into some phony intern group project setting. No, you're, you're doing real work uh, that's meaningful and it's the full nine yards and then there's also a bunch of other interns there that you get to do things with, that's your jazz too. But, and these guys are awesome. Aaron's here, Andy's here. Uh, there's a couple other guys that you get to know. Just, I mean, they're a pretty close knit bunch. They're up there with the rest of the finance department, being the those IS auditor guys. And uh, it's a fun, fun group, fun group. <coughs> yeah. So uh, there's your shameless plug for the internship. It really is a fun time. I actually started as an intern. I went here to Iowa State, went as an intern over a summer, and uh, I brought them back full time after school. Um, the internship program is a lot of fun. We, we want to make sure that you're actually doing real work. You're not going to be the guy who goes out and gets coffee. You're not like uh, a show kid in the Dilbert comics who's just always the, uh, the blunt of all the jokes. Uh, you, you get to do actual work, jump in with whatever we're doing. I think probably the funnest part about my job is that we're always changing what we're doing. Every two to four months, we're looking at a new system. There's so many systems on the railroad. We're constantly rolling through them. I get to see so many different technologies and learn so many different things, whether it's you know, industrial microcontrollers or if it's um, standard systems, Oracle, SAP, uh, more unique internal developed systems that are running the railroad. It's something new every, every couple of months. So if I'm ever on something that I don't like, I don't have to be there for very long. It, it's a fun job. Again, people don't think about technology when they think about the railroad, but really we have a lot of IT. And there's a lot of opportunity for IT. Uh, whether you're on the audit side with us or you start on, on one of the other IT teams, there's a lot of room to move around. Uh, at the railroad, we value people moving around because it's a big, complex business, and the more you can understand, the more useful you are to the team. So plenty of places to move, whether you 
stay in audit or even security or move out into IT development, IT management, IT infrastructure, or even out of IT. We've had people on our team actually leave IT and go into finance because that, that was their thing. But there's a lot of opportunity in this company. Um, it's really fun. If you're interested, come talk to us afterwards. I'll tell you about Hope Cap and uh, get to know you. So let's talk about some cross-site scripting. Um, just as some goals here for this presentation, I'd like to, I'll explain it briefly for anybody who's not familiar with XSS, get some ideas out there about how it works. We'll talk about some common bypassing techniques. Um, developers use some different techniques for trying to prevent cross-site scripting from happening, but they don't work very well, and they're pretty easy to bypass. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about some more incidental techniques um, where just because of how an application was developed, maybe you can't use the textbook cross-site scripting examples, and kind of get you guys to think outside the box on ways that you can circumnavigate the system and get some cross-site scripting in there that's actually going to exploit and do some damage. And then also um, challenge you guys on how to not get creative in protecting cross-site scripting, because it turns out that there are a lot of really good techniques out there for preventing that have been around for a long time and they're very effective. And I'll show you a little bit about those. Where you can go to learn more information. So as we start here, can anybody give me a quick definition of cross-site scripting? Anybody want to try? I promise I won't laugh. Note takers? Yep, there we go. Uh, using code from one site to execute the same effect on another site. Yeah, that, that's a lot of it. You're, you're essentially, that the website takes input from a user, and instead of being the input that the website expects, it's actually code, and that code executes somewhere else, usually on another user. So here's a little diagram to help you remember how it works. Bad guy types and stuff in the comments, maybe in a URL bar, maybe an HTTP header. They're <coughs> injecting content. It gets saved on a website or somehow displayed by this website for another user, and it executes code. Usually it's JavaScript. Sometimes it's some HTML that maybe will call a third-party site to do some more damage. But that's cross-site scripting in a nutshell. It's kind of in two forms. We call it reflected and stored. Does anybody know about reflected cross-site scripting? Give me a definition of that versus stored. Yeah? I'm going to guess, but uh, reflected is just, like, it's pulling from somewhere else, and then stored is uh, the uh, malicious code is stored on the user's computer. Close. Uh, kind of think of it the other way around, actually. With the stored, it's stored on the server. So that would be more like if, um, let's say, Facebook or Reddit had a vulnerability. You, you, know, you made a post, and that post contains code. It's now saved on the server, on Reddit's server. And when other people read your post, it loads that code onto their screen, their web browser executes it, that stuff happens. That's a stored cross-site scripting. A reflected is one that isn't stored on the server. Usually it means that the attacker has to trick you into clicking on a link. And when you click on the link, something about the link contains some script so that when the web server processes the link, it will display a cross-site scripting attack to you. And that's how the exploit happens. So stored and reflected. Um, since we're uh, shop focused on risk, impact, and likelihood, um, you know, the impact's the same either way. But the likelihood for a stored attack, um, the likelihood of getting, causing more damage with a stored attack is much greater than reflected. Reflected, there's just so many more steps on the pipeline in order to get the attack. You gotta send out some email, get someone to click on a link, and trick them into doing that. But with the store, it's already on the server. You just gotta, you know, that has to be somewhere where they're gonna load up a page. And that's a comment on the web page, pretty, pretty sure it's going to happen. So risk matters in cross-site scripting. And this is what they don't teach you in school. They teach you that you can just you know, do an alert box. It'll pop up on the user's screen. This is cross-site scripting. You've exploited someone. Pop up on their screen. But this is not an exploit. Um, Pop-up boxes don't cause damage. Maybe they're annoying. If the system had availability requirements and you couldn't make the pop-up go away, Maybe that's an exploit, but let's be honest, pop-up boxes aren't very damaging. So when, when we talk about cross-site scripting, we like to talk about real exploits. Real exploits that cause real damage to systems. 
Does anybody know of any of the classic real exploits for cross site scripting? Fishing? That, that'd be one method for, uh, that's, that's a fun one actually. So with a phishing cross-site scripting, maybe you would um, make a website, redirect to another website that looks exactly the same and prompts the user for passwords, you know, like a fake page for Facebook that asks for a password and they type it in and now you stole their credentials. That, that's a good classic cross-site scripting. Yeah? Getting user session information or stealing cookies? Yep, stealing cookies. That's uh, definitely an excellent way to go. So when you log into a website, every time you go to a new page, you don't have to type in your username or password. That's because the website gave you a golden ticket, this session cookie. And when every time you you know do an HTTP get, you say you know get me this page. Here's my session cookie, and it validates <coughs> the backend, knows who you are, and sends you stuff. So if you steal that session cookie from someone, you become that other user. It's your ticket into becoming that user. You can log in and do everything that they can from your local computer. So if you can steal that cookie, that's a pretty valuable cross-site scripting attack. Any other ones you know about? Here's a few that I had listed down here. Um, injecting beef is the first one, the browser exploitation framework. It's essentially a metasploit for JavaScript. You do a script tag that sources from an external site this bad .js file or you know some other less innocuously named um, piece of JavaScript, and that will execute essentially arbitrary code on the user's computer. There's a nice little console with beef, and once the user has loaded beef in the browser as a victim, it will ping your console and say, hey, this user's running your bad code, and then you can just start sending commands whether it's commands to force their browser to be stuck and um, they won't be able to exit the page just so you can keep persistence, or more malicious things like exploit common vulnerabilities in Firefox or Chrome that would allow you to um, break in and get full remote execution on the computer. Beef is an excellent way, probably the most fun way that you can exploit cross-site scripting. It's a really fun tool if you haven't played with it before. Really a riot. I suggest trying it out. Stealing cookies, as we talked about, definitely a very effective cross-site scripting. Very easy to do too. And JavaScript, all you have to do is call document.cookie, and that will give you the whole session cookie. It's really easy to put that in a small GET request, so that when a user loads the page, it calls a GET request to your website, and you know the log on your Apache will just pick up the GET request that has document.cookie in it. And I get Really easy, really simple way of doing it. More complex attacks would be the CSRF or the Clipjack. These are both related vulnerabilities. CRSF is cross-site request forgery. The, the idea with this is there's some third-party site that you're also logged into because we're all logged into like 100 sites on the internet all the time. So let's say it's your bank, and your bank can take a request that says transfer money from this account to this account. And since you're logged in as a user, you're allowed to do that. So CSRF forces you as a user to do that action covertly from a third party site. So you know, I post on um, some forum, the forum is vulnerable, you go to the forum and my code runs, my code tells you to transfer money from your Wells Fargo account input. Uh, that's what a CSRF is. Clipjack's a little bit a fancier way of doing it because sites have gotten a little bit smarter and now usually your bank doesn't let you do automatic commands like that that will transfer money. So a clickjack makes it so that you, you think you're still on this forum site that you're browsing, but actually all of your clicks are going to another website because the CSS on the page has overlaid a gigantic version of the other website and put it to transparency zero. So you're actually clicking on a whole different website. You don't even know it. And then it, it tricks you into clicking something that you shouldn't click and transfer <coughs> money or you know, whatever the exploit is. CSRF and clickjack are pretty complex attacks, but more targeted, you're, you're you know, specifically targeting another system that you think this user is going to be using, but it can be quite effective. And finally, probably the most basic attack is to redirect the browser like we talked about before to do a phishing attack. Uh, just take document.url and send it somewhere else on the website. 
they'll think they just went to Facebook.com, but now actually they're on your, you're on Facebook.com, and that's your website. And now when they type in their password, you got the, you got their password because it just saves your local server. Classic attack, um, really fun to do. Uh, we tested that one at Union Pacific to some extent. It's shocking how many people will just type their credentials into a box that looks legitimate on a site that has a uh, URL that's close to what they're. You don't think about it. I mean, how many people look at the top of their browser before they type in the password? Anybody? I don't even do that. I'm, I'm probably susceptible to this one. So, pretty sneaky attacks. These are the ones that actually have impact. If you're going to do an exploit, this is the route you should go. All the textbook alert pop up stuff, not really useful. Um, and an interesting thing is a lot of times on a website, you'll find a vulnerability where you can get an alert pop up but you actually can't get some of these effective attacks to work. So as a risk-based auditor, we look at that and we say, you know, likelihood, 100%, you did good process scripting. Impact, one, you got a pop-up, doesn't really do any damage. You got to look for some real impact. So when we're exploiting, yes? Uh, side question, but do you do yeah. auditing of your personnel's habits, like, uh, like social engineering attacks or stuff like that? Um, we have, just, just very um, briefly. I mean, the honest answer is social engineering always works, and it's, it's pretty much known that you're always going to get, if you send out a phishing email, you're going to get 40 to 50% of people responding. And they will click on your link and they will get you know, their password stolen. Okay. If you call someone up on the phone, you can probably sweet talk them into giving you the password. If you dress up like an employee and walk into the building, right into the data center, probably no one will question you. Um, we, we do those tests sometimes, but for the most part we don't focus on them, and instead we focus on you know, some of the, these preventions, which would prevent the effectiveness of some of these attacks. Um, if you're going to fish an employee, usually it means you want to like steal their, their employee credentials or their employee cookie, but that's only going to work if you have a cross-site scripting in their own domain. So if we can prevent our own applications from having these exploits, then that at least prevents a way for them to steal the cookie because they can't do a cross-domain cookie test. Um, but yeah, we definitely do both. And it, it's definitely <coughs> to do the, uh, the social engineering side, the walking into the data center dressed up as someone else trick, but we have to do a little bit of everything. So talking a little bit about defenses, oftentimes developers are somewhat familiar with cross-site scripting. They know that you're not supposed to be typing in script when they want you to type in your name and address so they can mail you a package that you just ordered. So they do this thing called um, validation. They force it so that when you try to type into the input box, you can't put script tags. You can't put angle brackets anything fancy like that. You got if you're limited. Um, there's a problem with this technique though, and that it's running in your web browser. Um, how many people have control over their web browser? Raise your hand, everybody. Raise your hand. Say with me, I have control over my web browser. Okay, okay. You, you have control over your web browser. If it's running, if it's code running in your web browser, you can change it on the fly. Um, it's pretty easy. Hit F12. Doesn't matter what browser you're using, it, um, it all works this way now. It'll bring up a debugger, and you can just edit the HTML right on the page. You can edit the JavaScript right on the page. You can disable any validation that's happening on the page, and then just do whatever you want. Really fun technique, get you by, really easy. Also fun just to play with other people's site. You can change how it interacts with you. If they're doing it right, you can't cause any damage because they're doing server-side validation. But when it's all happening to the client, you can bypass it. <coughs> Another useful tool for this is the BERT proxy or the Z-Attack proxy. Two projects that, um, they're essentially interceptors. You run them on your computer, and all your HTTP requests go through the interceptor. And then before you send the request, you can edit it manually. So sometimes if they're using JavaScript to validate the input form, it can get really complex to try to figure out where their JavaScript is and disable it make it return true all the time. So it's easier just to submit a request that has correct validation, intercept it with burp, 
edit the request so it no longer has correct validation and then send the request on. And that will bypass any client side restrictions. Burp is a really fun tool. Zed Attack Proxy is a really fun tool. Uh, Zed is a little bit complex. It's kind of a scary tool. It's got a lot of useful advanced features. Definitely a fun one to play with though. So the moral of the story is, if you're a developer and you're doing cross-site scripting prevention and you're preventing on the client with JavaScript or HTML, you're not doing it right. It's code running in a user's browser. The user has full control over that code. They can just disable it and they can change it however they want. So what are we supposed to do? We need to do server-side validation. The server needs to be the one that's checking for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and stopping them from getting saved into the database or modifying them in some way as to make them inert and not actually damaging. Um, one of the most common techniques you'll see, though, is still a bad technique. I'll call it a hurdle. It's, um, it's a little bit better than the quote-unquote defenses on the client side, but it's still not a real defense, and that's script tag blacklists. So up until very recently, um, Cold Fusion, if you're familiar with it, it's a middleware product made by Oracle for simple web pages, kind of like a PHP-like language for creating sites. A lot of enterprise businesses use it. Cold Fusion used a blacklist on their script tags, and that's how they prevented cross-site scripting. So essentially, if they saw angle bracket script, angle bracket, they would just erase it, replace it with another tag. Um, can anybody think about why this technique could be bypassed, why it's not a good idea? Get your hacker thinking caps on for a minute here. Yeah? You can uh, quote unquote spoof a different type of script and then send, uh, like, make it look like it's uh, you're sending a crude script, but really it's something else. Yep, definitely. You can obfuscate your JavaScript in such a way that you trick the blacklist. Um, this is actually a thing in, uh, specifically in Cold Fusion. Cold Fusion used a regex for their script. So, like, you know, most people do, I probably don't have any good chalk here, but let's see. There's your regular script tag. But, you know, what if I did, you know, capital S, lowercase c, capital R, I, something like this, you might be able to sneak it by because they aren't looking for that pattern. So you, you can sneak past their validation patterns that way, get your script in, because this is totally valid HTML. HTML is case insensitive. You can do whatever you want. Um, that's a great technique for sneaking by these blacklist filters. Um, another thing you can do is stop thinking about script tags, because really exploits don't have to happen in script tags. Um, there are a lot of techniques you can use. The image tag is one of my personal favorites. The source of the image tag, as soon as your web browser reads source equals an image tag, it's going to call an HTTP GET on whatever you have there. So there's your cross-site request forgery. It'll send a GET to some other site, you know, transfer money from this account to this account. Um, the on error trick, on error is a JavaScript function. So if the image fails to load, in this case because source A isn't a le legitimate URL for loading an image from, it's not a URL at all, then it'll run the on error JavaScript method. You can just put arbitrary JavaScript right there. This is an image tag, so all those blacklists looking for script tags, not even going to look for that. And speaking of on error, there are plenty of JavaScript on functions that happen in various events on the page, whether it's on mouse over, on click. There's just a whole bunch of them. All sorts of them can be used. If you can, though, go with the image source. That's definitely the most practical one because with all the other ones, you've got to trick the user into doing something more. They have to move their mouse to the right location on the screen. They have to click on the right thing. And sometimes where your JavaScript is, that's just a lot harder to trick the user into doing. Though, as a, uh, a fun trick you can do, those spam tags or some tag that you put non mouse over in, you don't have to close the tag. Web browsers are really nice about fixing HTML that isn't written correctly. So they'll try to close all your tags for you if you don't close them. And if you have a span right up at the top of the page, it doesn't know where to close it, so it'll just close it at the bottom of the page. So your closing span is now at the bottom of the page because you didn't type it. So the whole page is an on mouse over. And if the whole page is an on mouse over, you know, the user's mouse is already on the page. So you'll get that exploit to happen really fast. 
But the image one is probably the most subtle because in the worst case scenario, you're going to get like this one by one broken image thing. And best case scenario, you can even hide it and it'll be invisible, totally unnoticed. So script tag blacklists don't work. Uh, there are so many script or various HTML tags now. Uh, the list keeps growing to keep adding more to HTML5. And every one of them is exploitable somehow. Somehow you can run and exploit in every one of those tags. So blacklisting specific tags just isn't a useful thing. Another common technique you'll see, this one is actually an accidental technique, is text normalization. A lot of times when you type in input on a website, they'll try to normalize your text in some way so that in their backend database they can save it in a consistent format. So maybe it's your address on Amazon for where you're going to ship a package. Most likely in the background database they're just capitalizing everything that you type in because that way if you ever type in something similar, they'll know it actually is the same address and they'll be able to match them up again. So normalization happens a lot. And normalization can be troublesome for attackers because it'll normalize what you put in in some way that breaks your script, whether it's taking spaces out or add, adding spaces in. It might just break your script and it won't work anymore. Uh, as a specific example, capitalization actually does a lot of damage. Um, JavaScript is a case-sensitive language, so any functions you use in JavaScript you got to get the case right. If it starts with a capital letter and everything else is lowercase, if you don't call it that way, it's not going to work. So you put that in your script, and the backend database capitalizes everything. Now what do you do? Your script isn't going to run. Anybody think of any ideas that might get us around this kind of attack? Yeah? I was going to say send multiple requests but with uh, different variations so that you can fill as many holes as possible. Yep, that's one technique. Actually, we'll get into an attack sort of like that here at the end. Um, another thing you can think is that not all exploits have to be JavaScript. Um, this is more fun on enterprises than it is in the real life because, I mean, none of us use Internet Explorer anymore. But um, VBScript is entirely valid to use inside of HTML in Internet Explorer. VBScript is a case insensitive language. So if it capitalizes everything, everything's still going to work. And the, you know, the syntax is a little bit different. It's not JavaScript, but you can get the job done. Um, there are plenty of other methods, too. The ultimate moral the story is text normalization um, isn't a good protection against cross-site scripting, either. So well, let's talk about a real example of bypassing some of these um, restrictions that um, is kind of fun. This is going back to what we were talking about before with kind of piecewise things. So let's say we got a contact system. This is something we saw at, at Union Pacific. And um, just to simplify it, we'll say this is for typing in your building information to have something shipped to you. You got to type in all your information, hit submit. Some other user is going to be able to view your information. And that information is not being sanitized. But Backend databases have character restrictions because that's just a standard practice to do. And each field in the backend database only accepts 30 characters. Um, you do get to use jQuery, so $.get is entirely legitimate syntax. You don't have to use you know, the messy long form of XHR requests in JavaScript. But you can't fit an exploit of 30 characters. Actually, as a challenge, if any of you can fit an exploit in 30 characters, please send me an email. We've, we've had this kind of open at work for maybe, I don't know. It's been since I, I, I was worried. I, I, yeah, I got the three letter domain for that one. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, 30 characters is we, really hard. We did get it with that. It just got closer by the firewall. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. In so this wait, particular how situation. many characters does it have to be? There's a quote. I was actually counting it. So that, you know, there's a quote to break out. Angle S C R I P T angle or no space S R C equals uh, P Q G dot U S slash and then you gotta close your script tag. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think somehow they do without closing the script tag to get it. Yeah, you can do it in an image tag. Yeah. Um, and that particular exploit worked with an image. But this example has been purpose purposely um, 
modified so that one isn't working <laughs> because that one's about 32 characters. And this is a 30 character restriction. We, we haven't been able to figure out how to get JavaScript to 30 characters. Yeah? Can you link multiple different fields to call an even longer script? So you can put 30 characters or whatever in the first field and then another 30 characters in the middle field, but they're all interconnecting into the same script. Uh, we, got, we got an answer. If we had a prize, we'd give you one. It's oh, true. Sure. we didn't come with prizes this time. That's for sure. <laughs> but that, that is the answer. So JavaScript is a magical language that is, has a global namespace. Every time you define a variable in JavaScript, it's available to every other piece of JavaScript on the entire web page, which is actually why developers in JavaScript get frustrated a lot, because they'll create their own library, and then it gets loaded on a page with somebody else's library, and they both define the same variable name, and it gets broken. So because of this global namespace, we can just start defining things in each box consecutively, and then in the last box, we'll the exploit. So in this case, you know, we got the HTTP colon for our first one, the rest of our URL for the second. We take the document object from JavaScript as C, and then we take C.cookie to get the document.cookie. We add them all together in a single string and use $.get, and we fit a whole uh, cookie stealing exploit in just a series of consecutive blanks. So then when someone loads this up, their cookie is gone. So the moral of the story is don't think um, very small when you're thinking about JavaScript exploits. Developers have often thought that way when they're pre preventing these attacks, that there's only, it's only going to happen this way. The input's only going to come in this way. But when you start thinking in these small, constrained terms, um, it's not good enough. The attackers are smarter than that. This is a fun example. I'm sure you guys can think of even more examples. Start playing around, see what you can come up with. Um, maybe one of you guys will get the uh, the magic 30 character. That'd be great. I, I haven't seen it yet, but if you can get it, um, props. So what do we do? There, um, we talked about all these ways to thwart all these various JavaScript preventions, and they just aren't working. Client side, obviously doesn't work running code in the browser, I can just change it. Server side that just kind of modifies stuff or maybe looks for specific tags, not going to work because we aren't confined to specific tags or specific programming languages even. Uh, we aren't confined to single input boxes. Uh, we can start sending in stuff from, you know, arbitrary modified cookie values or header values or weird HTTP verbs. <coughs> There's just endless attacks for us to do. So as a developer, as an IT auditor who has to tell developers how to fix these problems, what is the answer? Um, people have tried to get creative and come up with all sorts of great solutions to this, but the truth is there's, there's only one solution that effectively does cross-site scripting, and that is validate on the way in, sanitize on the way out. So when you get input whether it's from the user or on the system, you should validate that data. You should make sure that it's in the format that you expect. Um, you, you gotta be flexible. This isn't a perfect technique because changes to the system happen over time. I'm trying to remember the name of the famous programmer who said that you should never program your site to only accept the value cat when it may later be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, you don't know how your software is gonna be used in the future, so don't be too constrained. But still, you, you should have a pretty good idea. I'm supposed to get, accept an address here. Addresses probably don't have angle brackets. In. So let's strip out the angle brackets. Validate the data. Validation is your you know, instant protection against people typing in bad stuff. Though, as we've talked about earlier, this can only go so far. Blacklists are technically a validation. Um, you can bypass them eventually. But it's a good frontline defense. Definitely a best practice, something you should be doing. When you get input, do something to it. Make sure that it's valid input. If nothing else, this is user friendly because, well, let's be honest, we don't like typos. So maybe a user typed in something wrong. If your validator is good enough, maybe you can send an error back to the user and say, oops, try it again. It's user friendly. Yeah? Is it ever in a, a good idea to just scramble everything that the user is writing and then be, like, decrypt it in some other format later on so that whatever function they write, it's moot? Also a valid technique um, as kind of an example to that, sites like uh, Slashdot, I think even Reddit uses it, is uh, uh, letting users type in Markdown.
for their input form, and then um, not allowing HTML. Um, and in that case, you know, it's a whole different text format. And if they just they don't validate against that, um, interpret it on in the back end in HTML, and there's no JavaScript anymore. Though their technique is a little bit more advanced than that. And what they actually do is they'll allow HTML, but they only allow specific HTML. So they're, they actually will look and you know they'll see a heading tag H1 and they'll let it through. But they'll say a heading tag with a space right here and they won't let it through because then they know that you're trying to get an script or something. Their technique's a little bit more advanced. But you know, modifying the users and changing. Ultimately though, the ultimate solution is to sanitize. Before you display anything to the end user, you need to sanitize it. Use a standard function that's already been written for you by people who know what they're doing. And that will see that there's HTML in there that's not supposed to be, take it out. Or, you know, change it. So, you know, if your web browser sees one of these angle brackets, it's going to think, oh, there's HTML or a script coming up. What if it sees something like and lt semicolon? It says, oh, I need to convert this into the literal character angle bracket. And if you use that technique, you know, change all the angle brackets and the and LTs and the other ones and the and RTs, then it will get interpreted right and sanitized. The nice thing about sanitation function is you don't have to write them. In fact, do not write them. Um, it's very easy to make mistakes. If you go to a wasp, and look through the cross-site scripting pages, they have whole pages dedicated to ways you can circumvent people who have written bad sanitation functions. Um, th this is lots of mistakes, lots of things you don't think about. <coughs> HTML is very vague in where you can put spaces, what you can capitalize, what you can't capitalize. If you're trying to do it yourself, most likely you're going to not get all the edge cases. There are a lot of good sanitation libraries out there. I can't think of a single major project library that you would come across that doesn't have a good one. Even Cold Fusion now has a good sensation function besides blacklisting. Um, OWASP is a good resource too. Their site has a lot of links on it to the good sanitation functions. In fact, that's what uh, Cold Fusion is using is the OWASP sanitation function for um, Java. So when you're thinking about process scripting, again, going back, validate and sanitize. If you do this, there's not really going to be any process scripting. 99% of your vulnerabilities are going to come from end users. And when their data is being validated and then their data is being sanitized, those attacks just aren't going to get through. Um, we, we all know that there's always stuff that will get through. But this is going to limit it so much that then the, uh, the impact goes down. The likelihood might still be there, but the impact goes so far down. The exploit is just not going to do any damage. So there's plenty of places you can go to learn more about XSS. This is just a really quick introduction. I really like OWASP. If you haven't been to their site, it has plenty of stuff about making web applications secure, going past cross-site scripting into session management, and how to interact with your backend database, how to prevent cross-call, how to prevent SQL injection. <coughs> really good how-to guides. Also a fun place if you're uh, trying to get some ideas for breaking into stuff because um, it will give you lots of techniques that people have used in the past and kind of give you ideas for new ones. Um, public service announcement number two, don't break into stuff that you don't own because the federal government will catch you and you'll get in a lot of trouble and it kind of sucks to have you in jail for 10 years. Um, the developer cheat sheet was built by a couple of industry people. It's a really fun resource, just a PDF. I strongly suggest downloading this thing really useful advice on how to prevent JavaScript. Also how to think about some more complex educations about sanitation. Uh, what we didn't get into is that you have to use different sanitation functions for inside of the HTML tags and then for outside the HTML tags. And it, it explains the difference between those and where to use them and where to not use them. Really useful, concise guide on how to <coughs> prevent cross-site scripting. And then the fun stuff, this last one, is a uh, HTML anomalies database. Um, every web browser parses HTML different, as I said before. 
there's lots of edge cases and how HTML should be parsed and the specs are kind of out here. So this database has kind of collected the different ways that the different browsers parse the HTML. And as you come across specific scenarios where you think an exploit might work, you can look here and see which ways can I you know, inject weird HTML that will be interpreted correctly inside of Internet Explorer and therefore exploit this person's database. Um, it's a fun site. Um, a lot of, they have browser versions going back to like Firefox 4 and moving on until the future and they keep actively updating it and updating you know, how the different browsers work. A lot of interesting ideas you can get out of there for new and unique cross-site scripting attacks. So that's what I got for you today, cross-site scripting. It's fun. Any questions about cross-site scripting? Any questions about Union Pacific? If not, I'll hand it over to Jake. We're going to hang out for a while up here. Well, please come and talk to us. All right, thank you guys. So after this, we'll have our beginner's night starting at 6.30 for you.